Okay, so this video is going to be a little weird because I'm at home and not able to present it to you standing in front of the projection like in the classroom. So we're moving into our next unit, Unit 5, Chemical Reactions. So first off, as usual, we have some definition type things. The reactants are on the left side of the arrow and the products are on the right side of the arrow. And the chemical reaction, as it says, is a change in which one or more substances are converted to different substances. One of the most important chemical laws of chemical reactions is this law of conservation of mass. You see, in a chemical reaction, matter is not created or destroyed. I'm sure you've heard this before. Atoms can only rearrange, and this was discovered by this guy named Antoine Lavoisier. So here we have some atoms. We have four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. So we are going to rearrange those into, on the right side, two molecules of water. But we're still going to have the same number of each type of atom. We're going to have four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. So in this way, matter is not created or destroyed. Okay, this is like a written out chemical equation. Aqueous lead to nitrate plus two units of aqueous potassium iodide produces solid lead iodide and two units of aqueous potassium nitrate. The coefficient, which is the number in front, represents the number of units of each substance. So we have different ways of talking about these coefficients. When they're individual atoms, we just use the word atom. So when it's just 2mg, we could say two atoms of magnesium. That's an example. When it's a covalent substance, such as CO2, that's called a molecule, so we call it the molecules of carbon dioxide. When it's an ionic substance, we call them compounds, so that would be like four compounds of magnesium oxide. I hope you remember the naming systems of ionic and covalent from last unit. Here are some more symbols and definitions of chemical equations. Whenever we have an arrow, that's kind of like an equal sign, but its chemical meaning is to produce something. So the products will be after that. We have a plus symbol, which is basically and. You could say this and that. We have the states of matter being represented with S, L, G and AQ. Aqueous just means that it's dissolved in water. And the little triangle on the arrow means that, that the reactants are being heated. Okay, so now I'm going to go over a little bit of balancing reactions. We're going to go through an example and get some step-by-step -step instructions. Number one, it says write the unbalanced equation. That's usually going to be done for you. You are going to, number two, count the atoms on each side. That's why we had that counting atoms practice at the end of our last unit. We are going to add coefficients to make the number of atoms on each side equal. And you have to remember that the coefficient times the subscript, which is the small number on bottom, is the total number of atoms. We'll talk about that in a minute. You're going to reduce coefficients to the lowest possible ratio if necessary. That won't be necessary too often and double check that you have the correct number of atoms on both sides. Okay, so for our first example here, the written out equation says aluminum and copper two chloride form copper and aluminum chloride. So you're going to have to write out Al plus CuCl2 reaction arrow Cu plus AlCl3. And you should already know how to do that because of our naming unit. Now below that, we have Al, Cu, and Cl. We are going to count how many of each of these are on each side of the reaction arrow. So on the left side and on the right side of the arrow. So we are going to count how many aluminums do we have on the left? One. How many aluminums do we have on the right? One. Remember the three only applies to the chlorine. Next, how many coppers do we have on the left? One. How many coppers do we have on the right? One. And how many chlorines do we have on the left? Two. And how many chlorines do we have on the right? Three. So this tells you that they're unbalanced because even though aluminum and copper have the same number of atoms, chlorine does not, and they all have to 
have the same number of atoms. So going back to our balancing step, we counted the atoms on each side. We are going to add coefficients to make the numbers equal. So we are trying to make the chlorines get to an equal number. Coefficients can only be put in the front of the chemicals. And so we are going to put coefficients where they are unbalanced. We're going to put a three right here and a two right here. This gives us six chlorine because we are going to multiply the coefficient with the subscript. That gives us six chlorine on the left and multiply the coefficient with the subscript over here. That gives us six chlorine on the right. Now the chlorine are balanced, but we also changed our number of copper and aluminum. We now have three copper on the left side and two aluminum on the right side. So now we have to change coefficients for those as well. We have to make aluminum be equal by putting a two in front of aluminum. This changes the number of atoms of aluminum we have to two. And we have to equal out the copper as well. We have to put a three in front of copper. This gives us three coppers. And as you can see now, we have the same number of atoms of each of the elements on the left side as we do on the right side. That's what it means to have a balanced reaction. Now we are going to go through some types of reactions. The first type is called synthesis, which is a combination of two or more substances to form one compound. This is really easy to identify because there's only one product that forms. It might look like there's the same stuff on both sides, but with an example, you might be able to see that there's only one product being formed on the right side, meaning there's not a plus over here. That's how you know it's a synthesis reaction. So just like the example, we have two phosphorus and we have three Br2s, and they come together to form one compound, PBr3. The second type of reaction is decomposition, which is basically the opposite of synthesis. One compound breaks down into two or more simpler substances. You can identify this one because there's only one reactant. In this one, we have hydrogen peroxide, decomposing into two molecules of water and a molecule of oxygen. There's not going to be a plus on the left side of the arrow. Our third type of reaction is single replacement, where one element replaces another in a compound. This could be a metal replacing a metal or a non-metal replacing another non-metal. So here's this example, A plus BC yields AC plus B. So you can see that A is going to replace B in this reaction because BC was a compound before and A replaces B becoming a pair with C. Now these A's, B's, and C's are all just placeholders for actual elements. Those are the examples down below. So in this example, the zinc is replacing hydrogen in this compound and so on the right side, the zinc is then paired with the chlorine and the hydrogen is left alone. In a double replacement reaction, we have ions in two compounds changing places. So the cation of one compound combines with the anion of the other. Remember in our naming unit, we always named the cation first and the anion second. So that means A is going to switch spots with C and after the reaction, we are going to get A paired with D and C paired with B. You can look at it as A and C are switching places or that B and D are switching places. Okay, for our real chemical example, we have potassium hydroxide and copper sulfate. And after the reaction, the potassium is going to be paired with the sulfate. And what's left is going to be copper hydroxide. Let me know if you're confused on either the naming or where these subscripts come from. We covered that a little bit in class in our last unit. Okay, our last type of reaction here, combustion. This will always involve the burning of a substance and it will always involve oxygen because fire needs oxygen to work, right? So in this reaction, we're always going to have some type of hydrocarbon, which is carbons and hydrogens bonded together. It doesn't really matter how many, that's what the X and the Y are. But the signature of this type of reaction is that it will always form CO2 and water. 
so you'll always have carbon dioxide and water on the right side of the arrow. So in this example, we have CH4 reacting with two molecules of oxygen, producing carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. Okay, and for the last part of our unit, we're gonna talk a little about energy and how that's involved in chemical reactions. Okay, so in the middle of chemical reactions, energy is actually used to break bonds. This means you have to put energy into a reaction in order to break the bonds. Whereas when new bonds are formed, energy is actually released or energy is given off. And this usually is in the form of heat or light. So we can label reactions as either exothermic or endothermic. We call something exothermic if the reaction releases energy. Basically what this means is that the energy released by making new bonds must outweigh the energy required to break old bonds. So here's an example. Of that. This is a reaction that could power the space shuttle liftoff, right? We have liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen forming water vapor because it's a gas, and it gives off a bunch of energy. But some reactions are endothermic reactions. These are reactions that absorb energy. So again, this means that the energy required to break old bonds must outweigh the energy released by making new bonds. So this is the example of obtaining aluminum from aluminum ore. You have this aluminum oxide, and when you give it energy, it can decompose into aluminum and oxygen. So that is the end of our notes, guys. I know it was kind of a short one, but we will have a few Schoology assignments over these. So look for those in the next couple days. Make sure to let me know if you have any problems. And as always, thanks for watching.